Well, hello, this is Stephen Palmer and Jonathan Lerner. This is uh, June 8th, 2018, and we're about to conduct an interview for the Oral History Project, uh, Stonewall Oral History Project. Um, and so, Jonathan, let's just start out maybe 10, 15 minutes or so, just getting your background, your family life, religion, siblings, uh, school, uh, anything that kind of is poignant that maybe you'd like to uh, tell us about? Um, I grew up in mostly in Chevy Chase, Maryland. Um, <clears throat> my father was a foreign service officer, mostly working in Washington at the State Department. Um, my parents are were, were first generation Americans. All of their parents were Jewish immigrants from Poland, Ukraine, and Moldova. Um, but my parents were quite assimilated, I would say. Um, they both went to college. Um, we lived a suburban life that was very recognizably American suburban, picnics on the 4th of July in the park. Um, on the other hand, my parents were founders of the first synagogue in Montgomery County, Maryland, at the time that suburbia was happening in 1947, which is the year before I was born. Um, so we were part of a uh, sort of extended family friend network of similarly assimilated upper middle class professional Jews, basically. Um, not exclusively, but largely. Um, and in fact, uh, my parents became very close friends with three other couples who were also founders of that synagogue. And um, we, the, f the four families, did everything together, Thanksgiving and Passover dinners together. And um, we kids called all the other p adults aunt and uncle. And um, it was quite an unusually close uh, um, sort of matrix of connection. Um, all of those adults basically had come to Washington in the pre-war years. Um, leaving the places they had come from. So in a sense, they created what we now call a family of choice, um, unconsciously, but they just made friends, mainly through the women. Um, <clears throat> so um, it was basically a liberal, politically liberal context. Um, although because of the Hatch Act, which prevents federal government employees from being actively political in electoral politics, uh, my parents were rather restrained with their political expression. Um, but definitely Democrats. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt was a big hero. They took me to hear her speak when I was, I don't know, eight. Um, <clears throat> they weren't radicals, though. Um, none of these people I grew up around were radicals. Um, I don't think any of them had close connections to the common Jewish American experience of having been involved in socialism and communism earlier in the century. Uh, I mean, I suppose we knew people who had been, but not, it wasn't us, kind of. So it was a kind of a liberal background. And, um, you know, so I was 12 years old when Kennedy was elected president. So I came from a liberal grounding. And then there was this. Sorry, I hear. Uh just going to ask them to be quiet in the rest of the apartment. Okay. <clears throat> I just hear footsteps over all, all the lines. Who's the people moving around? David? <clears throat> Are we doing all right so far? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, should, I was just thinking of that almost being kind of like the first collective uh, that you were part of. Um, you know, kind of a loose sense. I mean... <clears throat> you know, but just that kind of, I mean, the sense of connection of a network like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Was that David or? Yeah. Glad you got to tell him. <laughs> Instead of you. <laughs> um, so, uh, <clears throat> uh, then Kennedy was elected, and um, that was also when the civil rights movement was becoming visible to us, late 50s, 1960. Um, I think the Kennedy election was very inspiring to us as the way it was to a lot of people who were 
liberal or progressive at the time. Um, probably, maybe similar to Obama's election, people were more inspired than they had reason to be by the person himself. Um, uh, but um, civil rights stuff was starting to happen around Washington. And my first political act, which was quite um, sort of independent on my own, was to go to a picket line which was asking for the integration of a, uh, a privately owned apartment complex called McLean Gardens. Uh, it was inside Washington, but on the same bus line from Chevy Chase to downtown that I used to ride all the time to go to the doctor or whatever. Um, and I went to this demonstration um, because I was kind of shocked to realize that this place that was like a landmark in my sort of everyday life was segregated. Um, I also went to it because I guess at this point I was in maybe eighth grade. Um, a bunch of kids that I knew who I wanted to be friends with, who were the cool kids, the sort of beatnik kids and arty kids, said they were going. So I thought, well, I'm going to go too, and then I will be hanging out with these people that I want to get to know. Actually, none of them came. It was just me. Well, it wasn't just me, but I, I was there by myself. Um, and uh, it, you know, I wouldn't say this was a galvanizing experience. Sort of nothing happened. There were 30 people, mostly um, very well-dressed, um, decorous black people and a few white people walking in a loop on the sidewalk. I don't even remember that there was any cops there or anything like that. Um, but it, uh, it was, uh, you know, sort of dipping my toe in that. And then actually I did make friends with that group of people. And through junior high school and high school, we participated in a lot of civil rights activities. Um, during the week between the two Selma marches in 1965, we all skipped school and were picketing in front of the White House every day. Um, uh, and we collected canned food for black people in Greenwood, Mississippi, one year who were boycotting all the white businesses in town. Um, so uh, it was this um, sort of political involvement, but also a sort of folk music, um, nascent youth culture, um, beat poetry, um, jazz. We listened to jazz. We went downtown as teenagers to go to bars and listen to the Modern Jazz Quartet and Thelonious Monk and people like that when they came to play. Um, and we went also later, later at the, toward the end of high school, we would go downtown to the, um, what was it called? Uh, a black theater where that had traveling performances to see the Motortown Review, the Motown Review, and the, the Supremes and the Marvelettes and the, um, all those people. Um, so, you know, it was a, a kind, I don't, I'm not sure what, how to fully characterize this, um, white affluent suburban kids um, affair or, or, or um, uh, interest in black culture. Um, although that music was playing on every radio station too at the time. So it was, it was kind of a seamless, it felt like a seamless thing to be part of these um, expressions of political and cultural um, voice coming out of the black world um, and the arts world and music, art, writing. <clears throat> Did your parents know that uh, about your um, political interests at the time, the picketing and so oh, on? Oh, yeah, yeah. And how did they observe that? Uh, I don't remember any big conversations about it, but they were certainly not in any way critical about it. Um, they and the, the the community I grew up in was a liberal community, so you know, to go on a peaceful picket line to integrate a apartment complex was seemed to be a perfectly um, probably uh, probably something they admired me for doing, not that they told me to do it or that they admired me for doing it. And that, that was in the early 60s we're talking about right that now? That was probably 1962. Um, maybe I was in ninth grade. I graduated from high school in 1965. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so in those, the early 60s, you're in that sort of crossover period, beatnik to counterculture with the folk thing in between there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> the flirtation with black pop culture and, and with civil rights. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. 
So, um, I mean, I certainly didn't think of myself as an organizer or a radical <clears throat> um, or as mainly a political person. Um, that I couldn't separate that out from the rest of how I thought about myself, which was basically that I was going to be some kind of an artist. Um, so the music and skipping school with my friends to go to the National Gallery and um, uh, going to downtown to go to plays and things like that, all of that was just this kind of seamless immersion in culture, basically. Through this period of time, as all of this is developing, what was your sense of your own sexuality? Uh, conflicted. Um, I mean, I didn't, one didn't have a language for this at the time. I had had sexual friendships with little boys from the time I was probably five, um, with a number of different boys who were my friends growing up, um, up into about sort of junior high school time. Um, without having any sense of guilt about it, actually, particularly. Um, once, one of the very early times when I probably was five years old, uh, my friend who lived next door and I were um, in there, hadn't cut their lawn, and their, the grass in their backyard was very high, and we were kind of like making out in the grass. I think we had probably taken our pants off. And this family had an Irish maid that lived on their third floor, and she saw us out the window of her room and she screamed down at us, dirty, dirty, get inside here, you know, and very um, critically. But I guess other than that, we were never caught and that she wasn't my, our maid, so I didn't feel any, she was yelling at her, the kid she was supposed to be taking care of, not me, really. Um, so, uh, so those early experiences were just fun and un, actually unconflicted and it was entering junior high school really and um, the world of um, puberty and the beginnings of dating, going to gym class, having to get naked every day with a hundred other boys um, who were in various stages of um, physical development. Uh, that was pretty confusing because um, I guess at some level I knew that like, you know, there was danger here. Um, and also I was fag baited actually in junior high school. Um, what happened? Uh, just called a fag basically. I was never beaten up or anything like that, but just kind of made fun of. Um, so that was when the conflict set in. Um, and I actually remember looking up the word homosexual in either a dictionary or maybe it was in the encyclopedia and found a, a definition that was a, as a pathology. And, you know, I mean, this is, I think, a probably classic story for people pre-Stonewall. You, you realize that there's this word that describes you and you try to find out the meaning of the word and you find out that the meaning of the word is that you're sick and the, you slam the book closed and try to pretend that you didn't know that information. So there was that. Um, and my response actually through, really through high school and, and for quite a few years actually was to try to force myself not to be gay and to go on dates with girls and um, try to have girlfriends. I never quite successfully I was not very good at having relationships with girlfriends, although I was like capable sexually with, with women and had lots of sexual relationships with women over the years. Um, uh, but, you know, I guess maybe because I was actually um, physically capable of heterosexual activity and also maybe because I had just enough confidence, just enough confidence or for whatever reason, um, I unconsciously really made the decision to force myself to pass or to try to pass. And I pretty successfully did pass for quite a few years. <clears throat> on, the other, on the other hand, I also still had infatuations with boys, so many of whom would be my friends. Um, so it was not an escape from conflict, actually. It was a... Um, 
created the illusion of not being thinking about being gay, but I still inside was in a state of turmoil about it. That period of time when you were with your friends and being able to have some sexual interaction with them to this time where it becomes fraught, what do you think what do you think that was about? What was <clears throat> now missing from the earlier experiences that was it the looking up the word homosexual and recognizing I think it was um I think it was the onset of puberty being in a matrix of, I mean, I went to a junior high school of 2,000 students. So every one of us was like having hormonal like surges all the time. Sure. And so that, that was like the, let's say that's the, um, the physical piece of it. The cultural expression of that is that kids start to date. I mean, starting in seventh grade, there was some, something called a Coke dance every Friday. It was like a you know, cocktail hour. It was after school, in the gym for an hour. Um, you could drink a Coke and you could dance to rock and roll. And, um, you know, so there was like this kind of social pressure in school to do that um, or to, um, to have a girlfriend or to act as if you had a girlfriend or as if there were, as was a girl you wished was your girlfriend. Um, the, the thing about discovering the word and discovering the um, terrifying meaning of the word was a function of all of that. The conflict came from that. And the reason that I, I think the reason I wasn't really conflicted about it before was that, um, I mean, aside from the fact that I saw that the world was pretty much divided into couples that were made up of a man and a woman who had their children, um, nobody was really telling me that I was expected to have girlfriends until I got to junior high school. Um, And nobody was sort of noticing partly because we sort of did it in secret, that I was having these little affairs with my little boyfriends. Did any of those experiences continue on into high school, or were the other boys differentiating into being with girls by that point? Um, no, they, none of them continued on. Um, and I don't really remember about the particular boys, like where they... what what their trajectory was. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think all of them actually were gay. Um, I mean, it was kind of sexuality that wasn't, it was completely undefined. It was sort of just games playing. It was just physical game playing Mm -hmm. a lot of the time. Um, So, um, I mean, I know for a fact that, that one of the boys who was a very close friend of mine with whom I had one of these sort of sexual dimensions, um, as an adult, absolutely is not gay. He's been married and has a kid. And actually, I still, you know, I've seen him. What do you think it was about you that somebody would have fag, fag baited you, to use your term? What were they saying? Well, I was also spaz baited. I was like terrible at sports and uninterested in sports. So every single day there was, <clears throat> there was this like terrifying hour of gym class with a sort of drill sergeant coach um so you know i was i was really bad at all that um and that i think that hour of the day was the hour when the all the other boys testosterone was at its most raging because they had all taken their clothes off in front of each other and they were doing this kind of physical prowess thing of playing sports so there was that and then there were other um things that i don't know if anybody really noticed this and called me a fag because of it, but if they didn't, it's because they weren't paying attention. In eighth grade, I founded something called the Gourmet Club. <laughs> and we, I got a home economics teacher to be the sponsor, and um, I organized a bunch of kids, almost all girls. And I thought we were going to make sort of like elegant dinners. Um, actually, we made cookies once or twice, and that was the end of it. But I made a lot of like arty posters about joining the Gourmet Club that had the names of um, sort of restaurants that were famous for movies. Um, like as if you were looking at a sort of abstract um, cityscape at night with neon signs. Mm. Um, <clears throat> were, were your parents on to where you were at at this point? Did they no. guess? They didn't say anything? Uh, well, you know, my mother, um, 
I actually, I mean, I never spoke to my mother about this. She died when I was 16, well before I came out. Um, I have a, f I mean, this is totally mystical. My name is Jonathan David. Um, the story was that, uh, and I'm the third kid that, uh, of, of four, the story was that when I was born and my mother was in the hospital, um, my parents were trying to figure out a name for me and my mother was like thumbing through the bedside Bible trying to find names. And there is the story of Jonathan and David, which is a story of homoerotic love. And she named me Jonathan David. The, the family joke was that a nurse said as she was checking out, oh, Ms. Lerner, you're just the most sanctified woman we've seen here reading the Bible all the time. Because um, she wasn't really reading the Bible, she was looking for names. But um, I, long afterwards, um, maybe when I was sort of a, a stoned gay adult, it occurred to me that she might have even then had some kind of um, inkling about me or there was something about that story that spoke to her. And then in high school, um, she understood that I was not happy. Um, we never talked about exactly why. Uh, she asked me if I wanted to be in psychotherapy, and I was sort of insulted. I'm not crazy, I don't want to be in psychotherapy. Uh, she asked me if I wanted to go to a different school. I said maybe. She said, well, there's this school in England called Summerhill, which was a sort of famous experimental school of the, of the era. Um, but I didn't want to be sent away, and actually what happened was that I transferred to a small sort of progressive private school downtown in Washington for 11th and 12th grade. And that was um, my mother's, it, the, the specifics about gay conflict were never part of the conversation because all, I wasn't articulating them even for myself. Um, but she definitely understood that there was something deeply troubling me um, and she responded in a supportive way. So um, I have to assume that if she lived long enough to find out that I am gay, that she would have been okay with it. That's powerful. It's a powerful story. Would Would you mind backing up to the Jonathan David part of the Bible and um, that that story, and just giving a little more specifics to what um, King David? I mean, you're asking me for like Bible knowledge. King David <laughs> yes, uh, had this <laughs> advisor or something, and there, I mean, there's there's a whole like passage in that's talks about their love for each other and uh, I mean it's sort of it's sort of an understood thing that one interpretation of this is that there was a homosexual relationship between these people and after all the you know this is the era of the Greeks and the Romans and everything why not <laughs> um, okay let's bring it up then to um, more of your um, well, actually, let me just, your 11th and 12th grade, um, mm -hmm. um, how, was that a better situation than uh, 10th yeah, grade? Yeah, it was a better situation for a lot of reasons. Um, first of all, it was a school, a set, the student body was tiny. There, in, my, in my class, there were 47 people. Um, in the whole school, I think there were 200 people. Um, unlike the big high school that had 2,500 students, um, basically, there were no jocks and nerds. It was all like um, beatnik and arty kids. Um, so, and, and moody. Every, everybody was moody. Everybody was arty. Everybody was smoking cigarettes. And then pretty soon we were smoking pot. Um, there were several of the, the, the staff was small and pretty close knit. Several of the staff members were gay, and everybody knew that they were gay. Um, I mean, it wasn't really talked about, and, or if it was, it was talked about rather derisively, but still, it was a fact that you actually had people who weren't really hiding it. Um, and uh, I think just because of the intimacy and because the, um, in that kind of scene where it was basically kind of um, freaks and arty, beatnik kids instead of like cheerleader and jock kind of kids dominating um there wasn't a lot of like 
dating activity and, and that whole pressure about like girlfriends and boyfriends and like in the big public school the boys waiting for the girls during the changeover between classes to walk them holding hand you know walk your girlfriend or carry her books down the hall to the next classroom I mean none of that sort of um, culture of teenage you know 19, early 60s teenage behavior was present really um, I mean people some people had sex and some I guess there were a few like boyfriend girlfriend relationships um, but it just wasn't the, the, the pressure to do it was relieved wasn't there so I felt much more comfortable um, oh, it sounds like the the hard-edged social mores had a not evaporated totally, but certainly were melted down into something much easier for, right? Somebody there like was you to more space to just be who you were. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. yeah. I mean, on the other hand, like uh, here's a sort of interesting st story about how imperfect it still was. Um, the art teacher was one of the teachers who was everybody knew was gay. <clears throat> um, in this school, you, there were several, as a senior, you could major in certain things. You could major in music, you could major in art. Um, everybody took all the same classes, but if you were one of those majors, you got like an extra hour or something in the studio. <clears throat> so I was an art major. And um, uh, Dante, I can use his name because I'm sure he's dead in any way. It's, I, we live in liberated times. Um, <clears throat> Dante was the art teacher. Uh, Toward the end of the spring semester, I can't really remember the form it took, but a lot of tension sort of developed between us. And it finally it got to a point where he said, I can't work with you here. You can't come to the studio anymore. So he basically kicked me out. Um, and uh, later, I sort of thought that, I mean, years later, I understood that to be that he was too conflicted himself about me being there. Um, and he wasn't handling it very well. After all, he was a grown-up and a teacher. But um, so, you know, I don't mean to portray this school as progressive as it was as, as being um, particularly uh, um, clear or liberated in terms of sexual politics and gender politics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But better than where you came from before. It was better than where I came from, yeah. yeah. So the, the mid-late 60s are unwinding, if you wouldn't mind talking about the development of your political consciousness with the war and so on at that point. Well, you know, when I was at Hawthorne, that's the name of that school in Washington, um, the private school, um, which no longer exists. Uh, when I was in my spring of my senior year in 1965, the first national demonstration against the war was called by S Students for Democratic Society, SDS. And um, who the organizers asked the school if they could use our gymnasium over that weekend for people to sleep in. And one of the things about the school was that we had a, a town meeting every day um, where whatever sort of issue was at, happening in the school or whatever announcements um, were sort of thrown out to the whole student body would get together. So the headmaster came to us one day and said, there's this group of college students who are coming on a demonstration against the war in Vietnam, and they'd like to use the gymnasium. Do you guys want them to use the gymnasium? Like, it was going to be our decision, the students. And um, people spoke for it and against it. And I, I, I don't think I spoke. I'm quite sure I didn't speak for or against it. But I actually opposed the idea of letting them use our gymnasium which is a sign of how far away the war in Vietnam still was from my consciousness. I mean, obviously, I knew it was happening, if for no other reason than these people were coming to demonstrate against it. But um, I was very aware of civil rights. I mean, this was the same year as Selma, actually. It was the same year that I skipped school to, you know, just a couple of months before that. It was, I think it was February. And the, the, the anti-war demonstration was probably April. Um, so civil rights as a political um, conflict and reality was on my mind or in my consciousness, whereas the Vietnam War was very dim. And um, I remember thinking, well, you know, it's none of our business. We don't, why should we get involved kind of thing? So um, 
And that just shows to Goya that um, people's consciousness develops unevenly, let's say. Sure. Um, I went to college at Antioch in Ohio in the fall of 65. Um, partly, be I was interested in Antioch because it had a political reputation. Um, it had always been a progressive college. It had been, I believe, the first racially integrated college in the country. And I also think it was the first co-educational college, or one of them, one of, us, of each of those things. It was also the place that the work-study co-op system was invented in the 1920s, I think. Um, and a year or two before I went there, it had become very well-known nationally because um, there were a couple of black students at Antioch, and there was, and it was, it's in a tiny little town in Ohio called Yellow Springs. There was a barber in Yellow Springs who was refusing to cut the hair of the black students. So Antioch, which always had attracted like a ra radically oriented student body. Um, the, a lot of the students demonstrated against this barber, and this ended up in Life Magazine, which was the YouTube of its day. And um, uh, so, you know, I was aware of that, which is what was one of the things that interested me in Antioch. Um, but what actually made my decision about going there was um, uh, one of my classmates was Nancy Adair. Nancy Adair was the sister of Peter Adair, who was a filmmaker who made, and actually she worked on it too, made the film called um, Word Is Out, a very early film um, about post-Stonewall reality. I guess it was made in about 72, maybe. Um, so Peter was already a filmmaker. Um, I mean, he was studying film at Antioch. Um, Peter didn't drive. Nan Peter had been home in Washington and needed to get back to Yellow Springs, and Yellow Springs is sort of not near anywhere, and so he enlisted Nancy, his sister, to drive him out there. It's, it looks like a day and a half to do it in each direction, and, um, and I went with them because they were my friends, and it was like, oh, fun, let's take three days and go to college. And um, so my actual introduction to Antioch was via Peter Adair and Peter Adair's circle of friends, who um, many of whom were gay, all of whom were arty, some of whom became or were famous gay people. Vincent Aletti, who's a, um, a rock critic or a cultural critic. Um, uh, Wendy Cadden, who was a co-founder of one of the early feminist presses after she'd moved to California. Um, others whose names are I'm losing right now, but um, here was a group of people who were like quite obviously to me gay, and also quite obviously to me um, warm friends and relaxed friends and fun people, people who are comfortable with themselves. Um, so I spent like two days out there hanging around in, in this milieu, and I just thought, well, this is where I want to be. Um, so it was, I mean, I was interested in Antioch because of its um, experimental history and because of its political, progressive um, uh, history, but specifically what drew me there was this idea, and it wasn't something that I, good, a chance to take another sip of tea. I'm going to edit this, I suppose. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Forgive me. That's okay. I forgot about this completely. Do you have to go to the bathroom? No. Just disconnect this. There's always something. That gave me a moment to get out of the uh, torture chair here. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that does look kind of torturous for a long session. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> But I'm trying to stay as close as possible. Um, Thank you. Okay. Okay. Are we are we rolling still again? Still speeding. Okay. So um, uh, it's not that in this little social circle around Peter Adair, people were actually talking about being gay, um, or that I was witnessing any like like physical 
connections between people really. But my gaydar already worked and I understood that these people were gay and then it made me understand that this was a community, the larger Antioch community in which this could exist. So um, it was kind of inchoate in my head but this is definitely what made me decide to go to college there. I didn't apply to any other schools actually. Um, those were the days when getting into college wasn't like winning the sweepstakes, you know, you didn't have to apply to hundreds of schools. Um, so, okay, there I am at Antioch. Um, not quite sure what I'm doing in terms of what I'm studying, but I still thought it's going to be something in the arts. Um, and not particularly political. There, were, there was an SDS group, SDS chapter there. Um, people I knew were involved in it. I wasn't involved in it. Um, but you, you couldn't sort of escape the knowledge of the brewing political um, situation. The war, you know, at, this is the time, post 1965, between 65 and 67 really, or the 68, or the years when the war was escalating hugely and the presence of the war in American consciousness was escalating hugely. Um, and to be at Antioch, uh, Antioch was sort of one of the nodes of radicalism scattered across the country. I mean, people who were traveling from one coast to the other, and in those days people, you mostly did that by car or by hitchhiking, might go to Ann Arbor where there was also sort of a kind of radical progressive community and then they might come to Yellow Springs and then they might go on to Boulder and then, you know, it was, there were these sort of academic hotbeds of counterculture radical politics, um, and Antioch was one of them, as small as it was, it was quite a small school actually, 1,500 students. Um, so uh, I was not sort of overt, I wasn't actively involved in politics, but I was sort of by osmosis I was getting it, and I was close to people who were. And um, one of the things that I got involved in there was um, what the kind of thing that, thing that we used to call guerrilla theater, um, a big um, sort of contrived um, happening. Um, once again, organized by Peter Adair, by the way. Um, this was at a time when a number of um, Buddhist monks and nuns in Vietnam had burned themselves to death as a protest against the war. And there was an upcoming, uh, it was the spring of 67, I think, there was an upcoming national mobilization against the war in um, simultaneously, I think, in New York and San Francisco. And we wanted to agitate for people to go to the one in New York. So we, out of a department store mannequin, we created a dummy, lifelike human dummy, sitting in the lotus position, and it, um, at dinner one evening, when we knew that virtually the whole college would be in the dining hall, <clears throat> which had a wall of windows facing the street, we um, drove a Volkswagen van in front of the dining hall with the cargo doors facing the other way. We drove two cars across the street at either end of the block so that no other cars could come in. I mean, we sort of blocked the street. Set this dummy on the pavement, doused it with gasoline, the VW drove away, lit the thing on fire, and a woman who was well known as a radical activist, along with the man who she eventually married, Ditto, ran into the dining hall and screamed, Dick has burned himself. And people looked out the window and there was this person sitting on the pavement burning. Um, and it looked real. So it was a really shocking event. Um, most people came out, many people came outside. Um, pretty quickly, I think it was clear that it, what it was, that it wasn't a person, because it didn't collapse in the, in the way, or writhe around or anything like that. Um, so I don't think anybody was fooled for very long, but it was a very electrifying moment. It was dusk. Um, this kind of thing didn't really happen. Um, this kind of uh, invasive um, 
confrontation with a reality that was bigger and outside of your own reality. I mean, it still doesn't happen that much, but I mean, it, it became more of a thing, I think, later. Um, and uh, it was, um, it was, you know, had quite an effect on the college community. Um, so that was sort of the extent, really, of my political activism in the two years I was at Antioch. Um, I, don't, I don't think I ever went to an SDS meeting. I don't think I, I actually did not go to New York myself to that demonstration, and I don't think I went to any other demonstrations during that time. Um, but I was gradually, obviously, um, becoming more sort of seamlessly immersed in radical politics at the same time as becoming immersed in radical youth culture and immersed in the music and the drug culture. While you were becoming immersed in the, the counterculture of the time, and you did see other gay people at Antioch and so on, did that help you approach your own sexuality a little bit more, or? No. <clears throat> I mean, I still felt attraction, was conscious of feeling attraction to other guys. Um, I was still trying to have girlfriends. Um, so, no. Okay. Um, it might, you know, it might have because it worked. It did that for other people. There, there were, you know, there were, you know, a number of people who were clearly gay and who, were, some of whom who were like really out and like didn't give a shit um, at Antioch. Um, so, you know, I had models that made it conceivable, but I didn't um, internalize that possibility. I'm just, uh, you know, I, I'm going to go off the beaten track for a second yeah, and yeah. chat a little bit. Sure. Which I, I don't usually yeah, it's, do. Yeah, it's easier to chat than tell my own story. Well, <laughs> no, but, you know, it's interesting to me because th there's parallels. You're 13 years older than I am. Parallels uh, in our lives. And I went to uh, SUNY Purchase, and it was the only school that I was interested in going to. And it was had a counterculture feel and a mm -hmm. very strong gay population and punks and, you know, so on. Um, very liberal politics, uh, social mores were much different. And um, so I had all of that in front of me, and still I also didn't totally internalize. I was still trying to have uh, girlfriends and trying to do this other thing in spite of the fact that I was in what I suppose would be called now a safe space. Um, in a fact, a safer space. A safer space. I mean, actually, the... the um, uh, the gay union at school, what, I found it very intimidating, if anything, and, you know, kind of, uh, this is your story. Anyway, I, just that you also went to one of those alternative mm -hmm. schools. In my high school, David and I went to the same alternative high school as well, mm -hmm. the community school uh, on Long Island. So, anyway. Well, coming out is hard, period. I mean, I like to think, or rather, I hope that it's easier now than it was for people who were coming up when I was. But right. um, it's a hard thing to do. Yeah. yeah. Um, and in the interest of time, you have to leave at seven fifteen, right? Where are we uh, now? It's six o'clock. Okay. Oh, okay. We're okay. Uh, okay. I mean, I guess we're okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, the, the thing I have to try to remind myself not to do is there's about fifteen different tangents I could have taken with you already. I was like, put that. Put that aside, Stephen. Put that aside. Put that oh, aside. You're driving the boat. <laughs> <laughs> Not the best analogy. So, um, uh, talk some more about your increasing radicalization, um, and then <clears throat> and then we'll pull sexuality back into that again. Um, I dropped out of Antioch in the summer of '67 and moved to New York. Um, my intention was to get into theater. Um, Antioch had a theater department, but for some reason I didn't think that was a place I could be, so I had to drop out. People, dropping out was a thing in the, those days. Um, <clears throat> and uh, um, once I did that and I was here in New York and I was um, 
taking acting and dance classes and looking for work as a stagehand and stuff um, and living in what's now called East Village although then was still part of the Lower East Side um, mm -hmm. uh, gayness was much more visible to me um, I mean in the world of dance and theater it's you know at that even then many people were out um, I remember answering an ad or somebody had told me that there was um, a tech job available at some theater and I went and had an interview with uh, um, the producer or the director I don't know who it was um, who actually like made a move on me like during the interview um, and uh, which you know I didn't think I mean I didn't think anything about resisting it it didn't I sort of you know sidled away from him as he like tried to put his hands on me and you know I left awkwardly and that was the end of it but I mean these kinds of things actually were, were quite frightening to me um, not not the guy I'm not saying I was particularly frightened of the guy who like put his hand on my knee I was frightened by the presence of by, by this world that was so much more visibly gay um, because uh, I think it was, I think other people in this world looked at me and assumed that I was gay, you know, or they may have, you know, I was young still, I was 19, I think. Um, they might have figured, they might have figured, well, he just hasn't figured it out yet, which was true, sort of. But, um, but so it was in, 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 this, in as much as I was afraid of coming out and afraid of embracing being gay, being in this milieu that was very gay, much more so really than the world of, at Antioch. Um, uh, and a little more, um, a little less sweet than the world at, at Antioch. Uh, Antioch was a sort of protected little village and this was like Big Branch, New York City. Um, so uh, that was pretty frightening. And then at the, at the same time that I was going through that with what I had thought was going to be my career path of theater, um, I was being drawn into SDS here in New York. My closest friend from Antioch had dropped out at the same time. He was someone who was very involved politically. He dropped out at the same time and also came to New York to work on the regional staff of SDS. And through him, this is over the summer and fall of 67, um, I was meeting the circle of people around the SDS regional office and the, the sort of local leadership of SDS. Um, and uh, that was also a, kind of a cool world. I mean, it was much more political than I had been. Some of, there were some people in it who were um, very ideological and very intellectual and um, in, you know, sort of battling out like um, theoretical world analysis kinds of questions, none of which really interested me that much. Um, uh, but it also was a kind of warm world. There were a lot of women involved, including many women who almost sort of at that same moment were part of what was just um, being born as the second wave of women's liberation, um, second wave of feminism. Um, and uh, at, so I started to actually be more ex sort of explicitly political. I remember going to several demonstrations with my friend Jeff over the over that summer and fall. And then um, by late in the fall, I was invited to join the staff. And um, it was kind of perfect because it solved my problem of being uncomfortable in the theater world. Um, it solved my problem of actually not being meant for the theater world and not really having the talent um, or the drive that it would have taken to stay in the theater world. It gave me a job and a title and a milieu, a reality, um, a sort of collective world to be living in. Um, and I was really starting to um, articulate and express my political anger simultaneously because I was paying more attention to it. So um, that was the beginning of my career as a radical, mm -hmm. um, which went on for another 10 years or so. 
The, the split of the SDFS off into the Weathermen, mm -hmm. um, you were there at the inception of that. Mm -hmm. um, could you just talk about, just to get a sense of the evolving, your evolving consciousness from SDS to the Weathermen, what was the difference? Um, during 68 and 69, there was this um, increasing escalation of the war, increasing escalation of um, militants coming from the radical movement. There was uh, split, there were splits happening in the civil rights movement with sort of younger, more militant people um, defining themselves as militant in distinction from the more um, traditional uh, sort of church-based mass movement. Um, there was um, very visible police repression coming down mostly on them, the black radicals. I'm talking about the Black Panthers and other similar groups. Um, and uh, in SDS, which was, um, I'm pretty sure, the largest and um, I would argue the most um, significant organization on the left in those years, the late 60s, um, there was a, a growing sort of sense of um, frustration, anger, desperation, and compulsion to articulate a direction for the movement. Um, um, I'm talking about it in the sort of leadership circles and the staff circles. Um, and um, many of us had, were coming to the conclusion that um, the American system was so rotten and so unresponsive that it was time for a revolution. The arguments were over how, how to build for the revolution. And the factions that evolved in 1969 in SDS evolved, um, or rather arose, around different concepts of what to do um, to build a revolutionary movement. Um, to sort of, it's a simple way of describing it, but um, there were three main factions by the end of SES. One was um, the Progressive Labor Party, which was a group of very kind of old-fashioned, like socialists. We should all cut our hair and go get factory jobs and organize the proletariat. Um, there were uh, two other factions, which had been one faction a minute ago, but the compulsion to be correct on the part of certain leaders was meant that it was important to our to like nitpick every like possible like hair of ideological difference and so it was important to make another faction so you could like fight the former friends who now you were thinking were totally wrong headed. Um, these two groups had sort of come together a year or so earlier around the idea of a revolutionary youth movement organizing disaffected youth, working class youth. Um, and also had um, a very uh, much more heightened understanding of the importance of racism um, and the sort of centrality of racism. And um, this is the first time that I ever heard that the concept of um, white privilege, or at the time we called it white skin privilege, articulated. Um, I mean, now it's a pretty common thing um, to talk about. It was not common then. Um, uh, we, um, the Revolutionary Youth Movement faction um, in the spring of 1969 um, passed a resolution at a national meeting um, naming the Black Panther Party as the vanguard of the revolution, um, which was a sort of fraught thing to do. Um, Why? Well, it's one thing to say racism is the sort of central thread of American history and black liberation, if, if there's going to be, a, it, it's, and it's even one thing to say if there's going to be a revolution, leadership is going to have to come from black people. And it's yet a different thing to say, therefore, the leadership that 
is going to come from black people should be these particular black people. And the fraughtness of it is that they were flawed people like everybody else. And um, they were exemplary in certain ways and corrupt in other ways. So, um, but there was a lot of, uh, in the, in the, in the um, fight to be the most correct thing, I mean, there were people who were endorsing all kinds of people. We were endorsing Enver Hoxha, the le leader of Albania, who knew who Enver, you know, we were endorsing Kim Il-sung, the grandfather of the current leader of um, North Korea. I mean, it was, you know, I'm more communist and revolutionary than you because I'm going to, I'm going to declare this person to be a great leader. So, I mean, it was, a lot of it was really quite loony. Um, and uh, in the National Convention of SDS in June 69, um, the thing completely broke apart. The, fact, the Weatherman faction, um, which had further articulated this idea of um, it was going to be, the revolution was going to be um, made by angry kids. Um, seized control of the organization um, and basically rigged an election and engineered a coup and took over the organization and I was part of doing that. Um, this crazy behavior was a function of the fact that we all were passionate and passionately outraged about racism and the war in Vietnam and the war in Vietnam as a um, uh, is a sort of placeholder or um, at, was the most visible thing at the moment of American sort of imperial involvement in manipulating other countries in general around the world. Uh, and, you know, it's also important to remember that at this time there were insurgencies, radical leftist insurgencies going on all over the place in countries in Africa and Latin America. There were guerrilla, leftist guerrilla movements in Uruguay and Brazil and Argentina. Um, uh, you know, there was Che Guevara who had tri left Cuba and gone to Bolivia to try to start a peasant uprising. Um, you know, we didn't like invent this idea, we were actually sort of copying ideas. But um, so that's how I ended up in the national office of SDS when we took it over in 69. It's 1969. It's, uh... You're in New York, and uh, it's a good time to talk about what you remember about uh, Stonewall, the, maybe the bar scene where you were. Um, well, actually, I, I left New York in 68 and spent a year on the SDS staff in Washington, 68, 69. So uh, what I was just describing, the convention that was the, the emergence of Weatherman and the takeover of SDS was June of 1969. It happened in Chicago. Um, and I then immediately moved to Chicago to work in the national office, which we had seized. Um, and that is exactly when Stonewall happened, like literally. And I was aware of Stonewall um, because I, I got the sack of mail came to my desk every day and we got every radical publication on the planet and um, it was in the news. And um, so, you know, I've long understood, looking back, that I had a, quite a clear choice at that time. Um, a lot of other gay men who were in SDS and in the New Left realized at when, when the sort of open eruption of gay politics happened that Stonewall is sort of a symbol of, um, and sometimes simplistically called the origin of. Um, Suddenly, it was clear that you could be out and gay and a radical activist all at once. And there were organizations forming, and a lot of people left the SDS and other sort of mainstream radical organizations, or rather not gay radical organizations, and joined the new gay organizations, like the Gay Activist Alliance and Gay Liberation Front. Um, so I could have done that too. I knew this that was going on. I saw that these were forming. Um, I knew people who were making this leap, and instead I chose to stay with the machos of Weatherman. Um, you know, and we were talking about the importance of fighting the cops in the streets, the importance of organizing angry, disaffected, working class white kids to go on rampages. Um, 
it was, you know, and it was a very male dominated, male led, um, macho culture. And, um, I stayed in it. Um, uh, I should back up and say something about when I joined SDS, the, um, the group of people around the New York regional office in a kind of similar way to Peter Adair's friends at Antioch. Um, some of those people, it, it wasn't that they were comfortably gay, but there was a lot of sexual questioning and a lot of kind of rather surprisingly relaxed kind of experimentation, threesomes and open relationships or like weird, you know, these two are a couple, but they're also a couple with this person. Um, and so some of that involved like triangles that involved two people of one sex and one person of the other. So, and there was um, even in our, a language, um, some people talked about polymorphous eroticism. Um, I think this was part of the general sort of sexual revolution that was happening then. Um, people were in general feeling um, that it was possible to explore your sexuality. Um, so uh, I sort of sensed and heard and understood that this was going on in, to some extent in this circle around the New York SDS office in the same way that I felt it when I visited Antioch. And that was um, another thing that drew me in to that world um, and, and drew me to make the decision to join SDS and think of myself as a a full-time organizer, a radical organizer, and very shortly thinking of myself of a, as a revolutionary. Um, but um, to jump ahead to 69 and Stonewall, yeah, I knew it was happening and I, uh, I never even, I don't think I thought for one minute maybe I should take this leap that other guys I know are taking into the gay movement. Um, did you feel supportive of it at the time? Uh, I didn't feel hostile to it. I don't really, I don't remember really talking about it particularly. Um, I don't remember it being much of a conversation, Stonewall itself, um, in the circle I was in, in Weatherman. Um, so I, you know, I, I don't think I was certainly don't think I was actively supportive of it. And um, it's also possible that I made fun of it. I mean, you know, as part of my cover was sort of making anti gay jokes and slurs and things from time to time. Um, you know, not it wasn't a, a wasn't a conscious plan, but it was like part of the pretense that I was living. Um, and it was a way to cover uh, well, actually, this whole um, entering into this whole sort of macho culture and sort of putting on this metaphorically and literally this kind of uniform of like, you know, heavy boots and street fighting um, gear um, was a kind of um, armor to hide this, you know, basically terrified gay boy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe now it's a good time to read that um, uh, sure. paragraph from. <clears throat> Do you hear water running in the background? Read like two sentences to set the scene for this. Sure. Um, the sexual promiscuity prevalent in the counterculture went rampant with us in Weatherman. And then I'm quoting here um, one of my ex comrades looking back saying. Um, you felt that if you didn't have sex, it was a judgment of you for not being attractive, say. We were so young, most of us, there were still all those late adolescent doubts that had to do with your sense of yourself as a sexual person. And now this is me talking. Doubts about yourself as a sexual person? For me, the program of smashing monogamy, in other words, all this promiscuity, engendered a certain smug revenge. I hadn't ever had a steady girlfriend relationship that was any good for now obvious reasons. I could function sexually with women and did try or pretend, but what I really wanted was a boyfriend, which was an impossibility at least as long as I remained in the closet or in our organization. 
I too took advantage of the new availability of sex on demand with women. But it was always straight men, my straight friends, dashing leader types typically, whom I really wanted. And with the exception of a fleeting period toward the end of the weatherman days, male homosexuality was out of the question in our macho culture. Lesbianism did not quite pose the same threat, a phenomenon akin to the titillation of girl-on-girl -girl sex in the hetero pornography produced for male viewers. Now and then I would proposition one of those guys I desired. None of them was surprised that I sought sex with men. People usually do know when you are, when you finally confess that you're funny that way. But with one exception, I was always turned down, and usually, I must say, turned down gently. But then these were my actual friends. They may have felt awkward, but to their credit, they didn't gratuitously hurt me. I explained myself to them and to myself as being bisexual. Maybe there is such a thing as bisexuality, but for me it was always just a cover for being gay, all the way until I finally did come out, long after Weatherman, in 1990, when I was 42. Thank you. Did the Weatherman have uh, a, a viewpoint on the Stonewall uh, riots or the, uh, in, within the year of the Christopher Street Liberation Day Parade? Would you, sorry, would you mind pulling that book back? I, I see it where it is there. Yep. Okay. That's good, thanks. Um, uh, I don't remember that there was ever any specific, um, you know, position or, or um, statement or anything about Stonewall or, uh, or the emergence of gay organizations. Um, uh, Weatherman was not very good on sexual politics in general, um, to the extent that there was um, any sort of articulated support of feminism, it was very superficial and sort of um, uh, passive-aggressively expressed. Um, there was, as I referred to in that passage, um, a few months after, the, after Stonewall, um, when we were, before the organization had gone underground, when we were building a series of sort of public collectives and our main activity was provoking fights with the police. Um, uh, and there was all this promiscuous sex going on. There was a period um, where quite a few women got involved sexually. There were quite a few women in the organization who actually turned out to be lesbians. Um, and a few men also got involved sexually. And for a sort of a minute, it was celebrated, really a minute or like two minutes. Um, and I think, but I think it was celebrated because it seemed like another macho thing to do. It was another outrageous thing to do. It was another um, uh, rule breaking thing to do. Not from any sort of deep understanding about where, um, where gay identity comes from, um, or from any deep honoring of gay identity. And it, and it, it was sort of a window that opened and, and closed pretty quickly. I mean, and with, over the space of a month or two months or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As the early 70s come along and there's the increased um, gay activism. Do you remember having a, a, a view about how that was going, how that movement was going, and how its relationship to you? Um, I never really had any direct, I mean, I never like went to a meeting or a gay march or anything like that. Um, uh, I stayed a member of the weather organization until late in 1976 when the organization had been underground for six years and it was breaking apart. Um, my commitment remained to this group of people um, and to these particular politics. Um, but of course I knew gay people and people I knew had known in SDS and in the, on the left who were now gay activists, I also knew and I saw sometimes and um, was friends with. Um, uh, 
I had a few like attempts at boyfriend relationships also that didn't work um, because I was trying to do that without actually grappling with coming out. I was trying to be in this essentially macho male identified straight organization and also be gay at the same time and I sort of couldn't hold all that at once. Um, and in fact, when I left the organization, I kind of bailed out with a woman and we got married and I was married to her for 13 years before I came out. Um, so clearly I'm a person who had um, a need to bury my identity or not deal with my identity, maybe more than other people. I mean, Did, I'm, I'm th so you were, you were with your X through the 80s, through the AIDS crisis. Mm -hmm. um, I guess this is sort of a leading question, but was there anything about the AIDS crisis that compounded the, the idea of being in a relationship with a woman? Because HIV could make, you know, would be the thing that you'd come out to and, um, you know, perhaps you were diagnosed and you came out at the same time. There was, I mean, there was this, Yeah, I know people who perhaps stayed away from gay identity for a period longer because of the specter of HIV. Right. Um, I was very aware of HIV. Um, uh, this woman and I, in bailing out of the radical left, went as far away from it as possible. We became antique dealers and moved to a tiny town on the coast of Florida. And we spent all these years driving around doing antique shows all over the southeast. And we had a subscription to the Village Voice. So even though we weren't in New York or any major city where there was any major um, gay community, um, we were in a business that was very gay. Lots of the people we knew that we saw week after week in these antique shows were gay, people we were friends with. And we were reading, I mean, the reporting in the Village in the 80s was the reporting from the front line. Um, um, you know, about the earliest, about the emergence of ACT UP, about the earliest um, medical stuff, about the fights against Reagan for not even articulating the word. Um, I followed all that sort of obsessively, actually. Um, I was also um, having clandestine sex with men um, anonymously from time to time all the way through my marriage. Um, and so the emergence of AIDS didn't stop me from doing that, but I did promptly start doing it safely. Um, and I, because I was reading the voice all the time, I was aware of what was considered safe sex. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, I mean, I do think that it's possible that um, the fact that I was, not so much the fact that I was married to a woman, but that I was married to a woman and I was living in Nowheresville, Florida, and I was not in a big city where there were baths and bars to go to. Um, that may be why I'm alive today, because um, I, I have plenty of uh, history of promiscuous sex. Um, I've been to the baths many times when I had the opportunity. Um, and I've thought, looking back, you know, maybe I'm one of those people who just can't catch this disease. I believe there are people like that. Or maybe I just was protected by circumstances. Um, and if I'd been in a big city with a big gay world, um, I may have uh, had a different medical outcome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I don't, th I didn't stay married to protect myself from HIV. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what led up to you coming out at 42? Um, well, this, was a, this had been a very um, sort of strangely disconnected life. We lived, we moved around into different places in Florida and we were on the road all the time and we never actually had any sort of community and it was, um, it was sort of a hard way to live. It was just, it, it was, and, and it wasn't a great marriage either, um, sort of, obviously. Uh, 
it wasn't terrible marriage. I mean, it wasn't torture, but it wasn't really what I wanted to be doing. We decided to move to Atlanta because um, it was sort of the center of our circuit geographically, and we'd been going there frequently to do shows. We knew some people there. Um, so we moved to Atlanta and, uh, without realizing it, bought a house in what was at the time a pioneer gay urban neighborhood. Um, every time I went out and walked the dog, I was cruised. Um, this was Atlanta, big city, big gay city, weekly gay newspaper. You know, suddenly, like, I'm here I am in the middle of it. Um, I mean, now I think that my impetus for getting us to move to Atlanta was to put myself in the middle of it. At the time, it seemed coincidental. Um, but within a year, I met a guy, um, and I wanted to be with him, and I realized I just didn't want to fake this anymore. So um, that's kind of how that happened, and I was 42 when it happened. Mm -hmm. How did your wife take it at the time? Uh, very hard. Um, it's not that she didn't know that I had been with men or was bisexual or whatever. Um, she'd been with women also. Um, I mean, that wasn't a secret between us. Um, but I think she was older than me. I think she thought her life was pretty settled and suddenly, you know, I was disrupting it pretty badly. And also she was angry at discovering that I'd been like sneaking around on her too, mm -hmm. quite legitimately. Mm -hmm. We spoke about um, your political consciousness during um, Stonewall and afterwards. Um, how about through um, the 80s um, and your take uh, as a weather person at one point on ACT UP and their activism? Um, what, were, what was your viewpoint on that activism on their part? Um, I loved the creativity of ACT UP. Um, and I knew, I knew about it from uh, reading The Voice, and I knew about it because um, a close friend of mine who had been in Weatherman um, was very active in ACT UP. Um, and I was visiting him, I went to an ACT UP meeting with him, which was felt a lot like SDS meetings at their best with lots of like ferment and craziness and roll arena on her roller skates and um, uh, you know no I thought it was great I thought it was like a really creative political response I mean the die the die-ins the um, actually the man I'm married to now who wasn't very involved has described how. Um, his, his main act that he ever did with people from ACT UP was, um, I think I have the, the like geography of this right, it would have been uh, on the Sunday of the St. Patrick's Day Parade. They went to um, brunch at Bloomingdale's or somewhere and then like went up on the roof and hung a pro-gay banner or Bonnet bon Teller, some some department store that had a cafe and also was on the parade route. Um, the salient, um, interesting part to me being that they also included brunch in the action. <laughs> <laughs> Peter would tell the story better, but um, oh, a good uh, no, I mean I was I was very impressed with it. And I thought it was important. Mm -hmm. um, I still think it's a great model, actually, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of militants. That's. Um, Militant pacifism, actually, and uh, but but very artistic and um, media savvy, and good production values and all of that. <clears throat> Is there anything else you'd like to add to your story here? Any questions you feel I didn't ask? I'm open to it. Well. Um, I don't. Re I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I, uh, I haven't really been a gay activist particularly. Um, I did after I came out. Um, I 
was uh, involved for a number of years when I lived in Atlanta in something called the Gay Spirit Visions Conference, which still exists. It's an annual retreat. Um, it's like the fairies, only it's more organized with actual like speakers and workshops and themes and topics um, and schedules, um, and a little bit less custom. Uh, and, um, you know, that was a place where we took on political questions. We took on questions of racism in the gay community. Um, we took on also questions that aren't political, like why are we here on this planet? Um, and, um, you know, I had political skills and organizational skills, so like I knew how to chair meetings and things like that. I was sort of useful. Um, so that's probably, in an organizational sense, the, the main thing I've done um, that was gay in theme, I guess you'd say. That sounds, the group sounds like maybe, were you involved in any of Mark Thompson's Gay Soul and Spirit books? Mark Thompson was our keynote speaker one year. <clears throat> it was, Harry Hay was there one year, um, Andrew Raymer, who's another queer writer. Um, and uh, yeah, it was that sort of. I, I mean, you know, there were there are other there's there are other places in the country where similar things have happened. Um, what's it called? Easton Mountain in Massachusetts is a is a place where there are sort of these kinds of like weekend conferences and also fairy gatherings and things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Qu quick divergence. One week ago today, June. Uh, June 1st was my first. I now have Fridays off. I'm, my semi-retirement has begun, four days a week working. Um, and I was uh, going to go see Disobedience um, about the uh, lesbian Hasidic oh, yeah, subject. Yeah, yeah. And it was 10 in the morning and I was on the um, platform for the subway and I see this radical fairy looking guy with a big stick with glitter all over it and rainbow flags. And I had to go up to him, what you doing? <laughs> and he, was said, he said, we're kicking off um, Gay Pride Month and planting 100 rainbow flags around the Stonewall Monument. Oh, great. Um, and so I ended up going down and I met Jim Forat from the uh -huh. Gay Liberation Front, who uh -huh. I'll be interviewing uh, um, in the next coming week or so. But if you're down in the West Village, go across the street and just take a look at the park and you'll see the... Yeah. Uh, the, the hundred flags and the story okay. will be in Gay City News. Great. Um, I think uh, I think we will put a we can cut and. Uh